Hi, this is Praveen Dabas and we have a great and exciting episode for you today. Uh, apart from the uh, UFC 208 uh, post-fight analysis with Akhilesh, we also have two interviews with uh, Bellator fighters Chick Congo and Patricky Freer for Bellator 172 right after our post-fight analysis. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to the MMA India show and I'm your host Praveen Dabas with MMA guru and journal Akhilesh Ganavarupu. Hi Akhilesh. Hello. Akhilesh is uh, uh, still in Delhi both uh, covering the SFL and doing a lot of research and groundwork shall we say. <laughs> so uh, we'll talk about that you know he's a uh, uh, you know, the fights and everything also later. Uh, now, coming down to uh, uh, the show today is the uh, post-fight analysis for UFC 208, Brooklyn. Uh, there were a lot of really good fights on this card on paper. <laughs> on paper, that's the magic word. Because it didn't really translate into that, unfortunately, which everybody has acknowledged, including Dana White. But having said that, you know, the fighters give it their all. You can't always expect it to be a blockbuster uh, card. Sometimes these things just happen. But coming down to the fights, let's start with actually what was probably the best fight on the main card, which was Dustin Poirier versus Jim Miller. You know, both yeah. these guys really gave it everything. And what was amazing was Jim Miller's chin. You know, he kept getting hit and kept coming back. You know, you always thought he's going to get wobbly somewhere and, you know, Dustin Poirier is going to take advantage of it. But that never happened. In fact, Dustin Poirier ended up with almost, uh, he, he wasn't sure whether it was a, uh, broken or not, but he was uh, damn well screwed over uh, one of his legs. So, uh, and in fact, during the fight also, he, towards the end, he was have a, having a problem walking on his front foot, putting the weight on it. So he had to keep sh uh, shifting stances. Uh, right. You know, an, an amazing, a great fight, a brawl, you know, uh, 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 a large part of it, of course, was standing up. Now, if memory serves me, he tried to get in, uh, uh, Jim Miller tried to get in a Kamura at the end of one round, but the, the round was almost ending. So he was, and plus he wasn't able to hold on to it. But, but by and large, it was a standing fight and clinches at the fence. Right. So, uh, you know, so let me let me let me just say this. I almost got all the predictions right. You know, it was because the thing with the first fight is Dustin Poirier had the reach advantage. He was arguably the better striker, but Jim Miller again, fantastic striker as we've seen with Joe Lazon, and also you know, one of the best uh, uh, ground specialists because he has his own gym which is known for uh, their jiu-jitsu. So he has tremendous grappling, tremendous jiu-jitsu. So that was his advantage over Dustin Poirier, where Dustin po Dustin's advantage was you know, the range advantage, you know, he could keep the distance and uh, just work on Jim Miller with the jabs like he did. So the, the fascinating thing was, as you said, uh, Jim Miller continuously chipped in with those leg kicks where he wanted to take a, take away that range advantage in the way uh, Poirier put uh, you know, pressure on his, on his lead leg so that he switched stances which does not give him the advantage that he once has. So. It was it was very technical. It was very crisp. The way Dustin Poirier continuously worked on Jim Miller with with his combinations was, again, you know that that is Dustin's uh, speciality. Uh, going into the fight, I, I also said, you know, I wa I wanted to see Dustin's mentality because of his loss, the way he lost to Michael Johnson in his last fight, and Jim Miller was coming off victory. So it, it also you know kind of showed their mentalities, uh, how good. You know they were mentally coming into the fights, and Dustin Poirier was again uh, pretty phenomenal with his striking. Jim Miller used try to use his uh, grappling and jujitsu to get the advantage, but at the end, you know, I agree with the judges. It was uh, Poirier's uh, fight to win. Yeah. So you know, fight of the night and the most exciting fight brawl. Both fighters gave it their all. They didn't didn't hold back. You know, and they didn't really. Uh, 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 they, they tried to make it an exciting fight as well, you know, of course they right. got busted up for it, but uh, you know, it was really a fight worth watching and that led to a lot of expectations for the fights uh, to come. Now the next fight 
was uh, uh, was the next fight uh, uh, Texera? Was it Texera versus Canadian? Yeah, it was, yeah, it, it was Texera. Yeah, yeah. The, that next fight. Let me just uh, check on. Yeah, it was. It was the next. It was fight. right. So yeah. Texera versus Canadian. Again, yeah. this was uh, uh, what was a little disappointing was Jared's ground game because right. you know you whenever he was on the feet, you always felt Jared had a a strong chance. You know, because he's great right. on his feet, right? But you felt his takedown defense and his ground game really, uh, you know, was his nemesis, so to speak. Right. That uh, so, yeah, yeah. Dashera, you know, is one of the top five guys in the light heavyweight division, and Kanania just made his light heavyweight debut the last time against, if I remember correctly, Kutelaba. Yeah. And even during the the breakdown, you know, I we, we kind of said. Uh, uh his striking was going to be his uh you know uh, strength while it was tashera's jiu jitsu and tashera's grappling that was going to be his strength mm-hmm. so and kanani actually rocked tashera on the feet but you know throwing someone who just made his light heavyweight debut against one of the top 5 guys in the division uh you know we we thought it would come back to haunt ufc and that's exactly what happened but the way in which tashera completely negated and shut down kanani's striking with you know his his ground control was again you know that was uh, just just what tashera does uh, and uh, you know actually after the way tashera got knocked out against anthony johnson i was not even sure he was going to stand in trade with anyone yeah. for the he next was, couple of months. i think what was important for him was getting back in the win column yeah and to and to just get that mentality back because once he get knocked out the way in which he got knocked out by johnson it's not easy to come back and and stand in trade and kutilab again you know he's a very crisp boxer very you know he showed exceptional striking canon, 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 canon. yeah you so, said kutilab oh sorry yeah, canon, canon, canon. so uh, his fight against kutilab showed his his striking prowess so yeah. you know on the feet he was he definitely had the advantage uh, and canon again showed good cardio against kutilab uh, back in december if i remember correctly again so he had definitely the advantage in the striking department and tashera completely negated that and the way we kind of expected that you know you cannot throw someone that is ranked 13 against someone that is ranked 3 or 4 in the in the division you know and tashera you know he beat rashad evans the last time and he was pretty phenomenal in the way he did that so just throwing kanane uh, into the deep end against someone like uh, tashera was not the, the best matchup at this moment but he was a prospect he still is a prospect he is prospect but you you have to think that was a great opportunity for him it was it was that's you know that's why we say uh, the loss against anthony johnson might have done some some damage mentally to tashera so it was very important fight for him as well yeah getting knocked out in the first round in what 13 15 seconds you know is not probably the best way to get a, into the title contention so the way in which uh, he fought against kanane was very important for tashera as well yeah so it's you know it's the light heavyweight division is pretty much you know the only division where it's very very slim pickings uh, in the top 5 yeah who do you have if you want to fight for the title john jones is going to come back later this year it, it so tashera had a great opportunity yeah. if he had stopped kanane in the first round or something like that and made a decisive uh, uh, and got a decisive victory then he would be back in the contention You know, but the decision victory, I, I think, is still a couple of fights away from uh, fighting for the title again. Yeah, yeah, he is. Uh, in the lightweight, uh, we have yeah Anthony Johnson versus uh, Daniel Cormier. Then we have Gustafsson also waiting in, in line again. Yeah, so after Gustafsson, it's only Tashera. Yeah, there are no Dan Bader is going to Bellator MMA. Yeah. So it's very slim pickings at the moment. Yeah, there is. So it, the line isn't that long actually. Yeah, so that's what yeah. you know if he had got a decisive victory he would And be let's, let's not forget John Jones is is going to come back into the mix sooner yeah, than later. Yeah, but that's later this year. That's probably in July August. July, so but July will come sooner than we think. <laughs> you know, it's just like 5 6 months away now. So time goes by right. very fast. <laughs> And Dana also said once John Jones is back he'll fight for the title. So this was the right opportunity for someone like Tashera to kind of make a statement. Uh as I said I think he's still one or two fights away from fighting for the title. Yeah. He has to go through people you know people like either Johnson or Gustafsson. He has to go through one of them. Yeah, I, I agree. 
But I think John Jones coming back for the title is the correct thing because at the end of the day, any champ has to beat John Jones to be the legitimate champ, actually. Because John Jones wasn't beaten. He, he, he was beat by his own shit. <laughs> you know, and his, yeah. and his own kind of uh, whatever you want to call them, you know. So, but one still has to beat John Jones to be really seen as the legitimate champ, no matter what people say. You know, that yeah, of course, uh, the, he, he the, left, he abdicated, whatever you want to call it. The only situation is, how long is John Jones going to be active in the UFC again? Nobody knows. Of course. So, of course. Yeah, I mean, that's the best thing that UFC could do. They could hope for Rumble to win against DC and then make the DC, sorry, make the Rumble John Jones fight happen. Fight that's happen. the best case scenario for you. I, I think that is the fight which people really want to see yeah. because he does have that one knockout, you know, power for anybody. Right. But of course, so, he has to get through John, DC first, which is fair yeah, enough. John hasn't faced anyone with the knockout power that Anthony Johnson has. So that's going to be a very interesting matchup. John Jones's range and John Jones is grappling against uh, Anthony Johnson's power. That's yeah. going to be the fight uh, in the light heavyweight division. Yeah. Well, coming to the next fight, which was uh, Ronaldo Jacare uh, de Souza, Souza versus Tim Bosch. Uh, of course, went as a lot of people expected. <laughs> Once he took it to the ground, it didn't take him much time to end that fight. Right. Uh, you know, he's looking really, really uh, solid, you know, shall we say. Right. Really confident, you know. He, he really looks like he needs to fight for the title. And, and I think there's nothing left for him. Of course, Tim Bosch is not, you know, your typical, and all due respect to him, he's a great fighter. You know, he, he's, he's beaten some uh, uh, great fighters. But he's not really the stepping stone direct into the title fight. But Jakari didn't have a choice, you know. He been, right. kept waiting. He needed a fight, of course. You know, uh, still to prove that he has what it takes, and which, which is what he do, did. You know, he, he he disposed of somebody like a Tim Bosch within the first round. You know, which right. shows that he's ready to be the contender. I I I don't want to say after Yoel Romero because that fight hasn't been confirmed yet. Right. <laughs> so one really can't say Yoel unless while Bisping is is. Uh, still getting, uh, you know, uh, patched up uh, from his surgery. They pit Romero against... J oh, but Jakare and Romero just fought, fought some time back. But that was turned into a, an NC. No contest because of Romero's, uh, whatever you want to call it. You want to call it... Uh, yeah, drugs or whatever, positive test. So that actually, because it was a no contest, could warrant a refight. So there are two things. So uh, you know, first we're talking about the fight itself. Chakare, in my view, is probably the second uh, best BJJ specialist in the UFC after Damian Maya. His grappling is out of the world. Yeah. And he is legitimately one of the best grapplers in the in the world of MMA today. And throwing him up against uh, Tim Bosch, you know, be, uh, he was supposed to fight Luke Rockhold. Luke Rockhold was supposed to be the stepping stone for Jacare. Yeah. But once, you know, Rockhold got injured, his fight got postponed and he could not find any other opponent. Then UFC said, hey, so why don't you fight Tim? Because he doesn't have any fights. So that's the best thing that uh, UFC could offer. And Tim Bosch, again, is one of the top 15 fighters. So it's, it's not like he's out of the top 15. Yeah. So it made sense. Probably not the best matchup for Jacare, but it made sense. Yeah. Not the best matchup because just because of the styles and the skill difference, but it made sense because with a win over Tim Bosch, again you have Jacare who could, who could probably uh, move one step closer to a title fight. Yeah. Now, you know, in the fight itself, you you saw Tim Bosch trying to keep his distance, trying to maintain the range and work with his boxing, work with his jabs. But once Jacare took him to the ground, it was all over. You know, Jacare was all over him with his transitions. Uh, then he got in the Kimura. The way in which he even got got the Kimura was not a proper position for for Jacare. But the way in, the manner in which he still locked it in, he still used his transitions to get on top and and you know uh, finish the fight, shows that he's miles above anyone else in the grappling uh, category, at least in the middleweight division. Now the interesting situation is, you have someone like Jacare, you have someone like Joel Romero, and you have someone like Anderson Silva, who just won the fight. So who is going? If you, you if also, let's not forget Luke Rockhold. Luke Rockhold is still injured. You know, he lost his last fight. 
Yeah, but he is going to get better sometime sooner than later. You know, he's going to come back into the mix. Right, but you know, if you're Michael Bisping and you're looking at these three guys, who would you pick? Who would you? Who would be your money fight? It would be definitely Anderson Silva. And if I were, if I were Michael Bisping, I would look at Silva and say, you know, probably he's the guy that I want to fight. A because it makes more money. B because you know there is history between both of them. And C, I would hate if I were if I were Bisping, I would hate. to get into the cage with either Yoel Romero or Jacare Souza I know for a fact you know if I was I was Bisping I know for a fact that both of these both of these guys one an exceptional wrestler one an exceptional grappler they would finish me you know I know for a fact that would happen so who is the money fight for me what fight makes more sense for me it's Anderson Silva so now we could possibly see UFC putting both Yoel Romero and Jacare on on the back burner hmm. and bring in Anderson Silva and make a rematch between Silva and Bisping for the title. You know so it's an interesting situation in the middleweight division probably the most stacked division in the UFC and I think you know we're going to we're going to hear a couple of surprises in the next couple of months regarding the next title fight. I agree and let's not forget Chris Weidman is still there you know. Chris Weidman yes but he's still going to lot. Of course he lost his last two you know right. he's facing uh, gigard musasi now and let's not forget right. musasi <laughs> as well musasi yeah. is a damn good fighter you know and yeah, he's proven it over his last win streak sorry yeah but if i were bisping would i want to face a gigard musasi that is on the rise again a former strike force champion well, i wouldn't anyway he, he i i think musasi still has to go through weidman weidman still has musasi so anyway those two are kind of uh, think, uh, yes. busy busy with that You know, so he still right. has to choose somebody from the other, you know, uh, available fighter, so to speak. And Jakare can have a very quick turnaround because he didn't seem to have uh, suffered uh, any damage whatsoever yesterday. Yeah, and the other thing is, is his fight with even Romero was, a, a, you know, very controversial. Romero's. Yeah, I remember that fight, match. and I remember that it was very controversial. And I remember thinking, I thought Jakare had won. Yeah, so you know, a lot of people even thought Jakare had won that. So. uh if ufc says you know what let's do this all over again let's put jacare against uh, yoel romero and we're going to give chris whiteben and addison sorry we're going to give michael bisping addison silver now there's yet another interesting scenario you know that can happen i think ufc is going to do that might very well do that so as i said you know it's a very interesting time in the middleweight division i think i expect a couple of surprises at least in the in the coming months great so let's uh, wait for those surprises we shall uh, break some of that news uh, on yeah. our website <laughs> now's the time to plug the website again www.mmaindia.com don't forget to visit for all the breaking news now to the next fight the legend anderson silva versus derek brunson derek of course lost his last fight to robert whitaker uh, yeah. before that of course he had been on a roll uh, five fight winning streak oh. i think Four or four. five? Four. Oh. He finished four fights in the first round. He finished four fights in the first round, but he was on a five-fight winning streak. Uh, maybe I remember it being four, but okay. maybe. Anyway, four, four, five. <laughs> Let's say four, five. He gave us pass. He didn't win it. So he was looking to make a comeback, of course. Also, and what better guy? Anybody wants to fight Anderson Silva, the legend? You know, you get an opportunity, you grab it with both hands, of course. But Derek. And you know what I liked about Anderson Silva also in the lead up when you see all the embedded series and everything is he was so loose he, he seemed like he was enjoying of course he's always enjoyed but he's still enjoying you know uh, the lead up to the fights the fights itself he's enjoying the whole moment you know it's it's he he seems like he's he he's always uh, what's the right word grateful you know right. for for the opportunity to still be fighting at this age you know uh, right uh, you, you know he, he's of course a legend he's not what he used to be at 41 nobody is you know right. but he still gets the opportunity to fight these young guns and let's just make this clear according to me of course anderson silva didn't win as clearly as maybe one of the judges thought but derek right. <laughs> didn't do enough to win and anderson silva in no time seemed uh uh In, in trouble, even when uh, uh, Derek Brunson was getting those uppercuts, you know, when right. they were in a, in a uh, clinch, he was getting all those uppercuts. Anderson Silva didn't seem like it 
was doing and you know uh, of course they were hitting him you know and right. they seemed to have a lot of force but he came out of it not wobbly not nothing not you know he 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 didn't seem largely affected by them you know so uh, maybe my reading of it is wrong but you know what i saw was an anderson silva completely uh, you know in control all the time of course he wasn't he was pressing now and then when he saw an opening you know right. he was uh, pressing but of course not trying to finish as hard as, as he would maybe 4 or 5 years ago you know right uh, but of course nevertheless he was never in any trouble he was you know always uh, maybe not always controlling the fight but derek brunson seemed in all of him a lot and very wary he was always i think very wary of getting getting that if he committed too much of getting that counter anderson silva strike you know which is what i think a lot of people and is you could hear his uh, uh, coaches tell him you you know you 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 uh, giving this guy too much respect you know which is what he was uh, doing but how could you not you know people who have not have paid the price you know right. so i think he was not so much giving respect as being cautious you know of committing too much because that is what he did wrong with robert whitaker right so stylistic you know stylistically if you if you ask uh, anderson silva who would be the fighter in the middleweight division in the top 10 that he would want to fight it would have been derek brunson why anderson has always been an exceptional counter striker derek brunson has always left himself open when he's aggressive so uh, he, uh, you know as he even said against robert whitaker he was the one pushing the pace he was the one being the aggressor and he left himself open for yeah. you know uh, whitaker's le- first head kick and then the tko finish you are going up against anderson silva who has excelled at doing that for years for a decade yeah. he has been an exceptional counter striker you know he baits his opponents in counter strikes drops his opponent you know uh, so if you know the, it was an ideal match up for anderson silva not an ideal match up for derek brunson but at the same time it was we needed to see which anderson silva would show up you know yeah. the anderson silva of 2000 and, uh, of 2010 2011 and 12 where he was just undefeated and laying waste to all the all the opponents or the anderson silva of you know the nick diaz era of the chris weidman era where you know he was not the same fighter anymore you could see that he was not the same fighter anymore of course he was low he was lower because of his age because of the surgery that he had whatever it was so you know going into the fight i thought i thought i picked anderson silva to win i just i either thought it would be because of a Uh, his his ability to counter derek brunson's over aggressiveness or catch him in uh, no, a decision because just because of the fact that anderson anderson silva no longer finishes his, his opponents anymore so you know brunson i think was over cautious he was not just cautious i think he was over cautious because he yeah he 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 gave anderson way too much respect i agree with that because he's not derek brunson is as is at his most dangerous when he's being aggressive not over aggressive yeah. but aggressive and charging down his opponents and tagging them with his heavy hands and we also know that derek brunson is an exceptional wrestler he was a division 3 uh, all american wrestler so you know either you could he could do that uh, on the feet he could put pressure and and push anderson silva against the cage and grapple with him he could do any of that but what he did was he gave anderson too much respect he was the one that was running behind and resetting while anderson silva was chasing him you do not see that with derek brunson yeah he was way too over cautious because of just silva's pedigree and the way in which silva used to finish his opponents when they were let you know leaving themselves open by being over aggressive yeah and even uh, even when they took it he went to the ground i think once or twice silva is great off his back he's got amazing jiu jitsu you never saw silva in really discomfortable positions he was still right. getting a lot of elbows off of his back you know which right. which made uh, derek brunson not as active as he should have been actually right and an example for that is the chelson and fight you know chelson in the first fight it looked as if he was winning the fight or five rounds he was he was getting his you know getting the upper hand in the last 30 seconds anderson silva on his back caught him in a triangle yeah so you know so we we have seen that happening and chael sonnen again was an exceptional wrestler so but i you know in the third round it was weird because i don't think anderson silva really wanted to do anything 
I I thought he he thought that he won the first two rounds, so he, all he had to do was survive the third round. So you know, even when uh, Brunson took him to the ground, Anderson didn't do much. You know, he was he wasn't being offensive off his back. He was just making sure that he hung on until the the final whistle blew. So it was a very weird fight in the way in which Anderson Silva was a back to his old self, where he trusted his chin. You know, as you said in the clinches. Anderson was leaving himself open where Derek Brunson was connecting with with uppercuts uh, and with short jabs. Anderson wasn't doing anything. Uh, I thought that was his confidence, his swagger that that Anderson has found again after his his you know five fights where he was not not at his best. Um, but at the same time, I was disappointed with Derek Brunson because it was a statement fight for him. Yeah. If he had seen Anderson Silva, he would have made a statement. Yeah. You know, after his loss with Whitaker and the way in, in which he finished Judah Hall, this was the perfect opportunity for Derek Brunson to make a statement, and he did not take it. You know, he was being overly cautious. He did not take his chances. Anderson Silva left himself open many times. The old Derek Brunson would have dropped him and finished him. So yeah, in that sense, I think he was giving way too much respect to Silva. And at the end, even you know, I thought Anderson Silva won the fight, but 30-27 was. Definitely not the right. Yeah, that's that was what I'm talking bad. about. So, uh, of course, a lot of people, in, including Derek Brunson, feel he won the fight. So I would say you and me are on the same page where we would say we don't feel he won the fight. <laughs> Maybe at least that's what I'm saying, but not by that margin. Yeah, it was a whisker. It yeah. was a, it, it was touch and go. Yeah, twenty nine twenty eight does more justice. Yeah. But when I heard thirty twenty seven, I thought no, you know. That was not a good precedent before the main event. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we saw what happened in the main event, but yeah. yeah. Well, coming now so, to the main event, <laughs> you know, Holly Holm versus Jermaine de Randem. Uh, I was really disappointed with, you know, see now, see this is what uh, I was speaking to you about also previously. Of course, what I spoke to you about was what happens when a fighter is illegally hitting somebody on the back of the head. Right. And it plays a part in the final decision because the other fighter is getting hit and it's affecting him. Those are illegal blows. And what is happening yeah. to him? He's just getting uh, 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 like it's like saying, mat kar. Nain, 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 wrong, Main nahi karte, aise, aise nahi maate. You're not penalizing him. And the same thing happened here. You know, twice right. after the bell, and I think Misha Tate put it really well that it, it, the bell is really loud no matter who uh, how many people are in that stadium or auditorium you always hear the bell and you have just heard the 10 second warning bell right you know so the first time okay it's an accident but the second time come on you know and the referee i think uh, very you know poor uh, refereeing and i think dana white put it right then let's not blame him too much he doesn't have big fight experience exactly. he should not have been put in that position you know right. to say on the second time if she does it again i'm going to take a point off of her i mean yeah. what <laughs> the fuck is that you know again you're saying but you know what kind of shit is that you know you right. she did it the second time take a bloody point off you know Right. It, it, it clearly, especially the first time it happened, it very clearly affected her. It very right. clearly affected Holly Holm. She was wobbly. She literally had to lean on the referee to stay up. Right. You know, and how can you like, say, how can anyone say that that is not playing a part in the final decision? How can anybody say that? How can she just say, sorry, uh, galti se lag sorry uh, I didn't mean to. <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry. What kind of shit is that? You know, right. that you know, I think fight. is the worst kind of decision making, uh, you know, where it, they're very clearly illegal blows, but they're not playing any part at all. She's getting away with them. How can she get away with it twice? I mean, I fail to fathom how she can get away with it twice, you know, and, and, and people act as if it's not playing a part in the fight. Yeah, uh, so until that round, I thought that was the most decisive uh, blow by either fighter by the end of round two. But, I agree. Uh, main did after after round. So, see, the, the thing is, what happens, an illegal blow is different from a uh, punch after the bell, mainly because of this. 
if it's an illegal blow, if it happens once, you caution the fighter. If it happens again, you disqualify. But when something like this happens, it's it's crystal clear. First, if it happens, you you know uh, warn the fighter. If it happens again, you deduct a point. It's yeah. as simple as that. Yeah. It's like a knife poke, or it's some you know uh, not not something very illegal that can uh, hinder the fighter's performance. But if something like that happens, obviously the first time you warn them, the second time you take a point away. It's simple. But what Dana White said makes a lot of sense. These fight, these referees do not have the big fight experience yeah. or the experience of judging uh, MMA fights at a, at such a large scale. And this is the thing that you know uh, ticks a lot of people off with the New York State Athletic Commission. Why? Because New York State Athletic Commission have their own set of rules. You know, if if it was any other commission, probably they could have. Uh, you know just talk to ufc or whatever it was within the commission itself with the referee union and made sure that it was a, a referee that had experience who you know uh, could could officiate at such a at, a at such a big stage and just the fact that you know all right in the going into the fight itself i thought it was very obvious germain's you know biggest strength was a striking and her ability to strike in the clinches She's a Muay Thai world champion, former world, Muay Thai world champion. So obviously, standing up, she has more striking pedigree, and she's better off in the clinches because of the eight-point strikes which happen in, the, in Muay Thai, and not in kickboxing, which was Holly Holm's background. You know, so Holly Holm's strength, and I thought her camp was the best for someone uh, like Jermaine, because Holly Holm's camp majorly revolves around keeping the distance, yeah. you know, keeping range, uh, striking from the outside, and not. Moving in and leaving yourself open, you know what Holly Holm did even during her fight with Ronda Rousey, if I remember correctly, was using her front kicks, her oblique kicks, to perfection to make sure that she kept the distance and she did not leave herself open for counters. So for someone like Jermaine Randami, I thought Jackson Wink was the best can, and I thought Holly Holm would have the best plan going in. Now in a last fight against someone like Shevchenko, Holly Holm was just manhandled in the clinches. I thought that would not happen against Dirandami. I thought Dirandami would, you know, would have the advantage in the clinches just because of her background. But Holly did have the advantage in the clinches. Yeah. That was the thing that I noticed. Yeah. Right. But now with the change in rules, the control time doesn't matter much. So with the with the change in unified rules, you have different set of priorities that the that the judges look at. And control time before was at the top. Now it's at the bottom. Yeah. So now I can under, I mean I can understand a 48-47 in favor of Dirandomi if the, you know we do not take the illegal blows uh, or the blows after the rounds into consideration. But once that happens, a point needs to be deducted. There are no two question, no two ways about it. There there is no second question. Once a fighter does that more than once, you deduct a point. It's simple. It's very simple. And the referee did not do that. Uh, so you know going even until the fifth round, I thought Holly Holm won just yeah. because. She was more dominant in the clinches. Uh, yeah, Dirandami did tag Holly a couple of times, but Holly did as well. She staggered, if I remember, the third or the fourth round. She yeah. staggered uh, Jermaine. So she did, and that I think she she agrees that she should have finished it off or been more aggressive at that point. She should have, yes. Yeah. But I thought, you know, uh, leaving yourself open or or just lunging in against uh, someone like Dirandami. Who is an exceptional Muay Thai striker is not a good good idea. Uh, probably, you know, Holly and she did try taking Jermaine down. Now here's the here's the thing, she tried taking Jermaine down, but um, Jermaine all through a camp must have worked on her on her takedown defense because it was very good. But we never saw what would have happened had Jermaine gone to the ground. Now, if you're talking about Jermaine going up against someone like Chris Cyborg, Cyborg would maul her. Cyborg, you know. Even yeah. if you talk about stand-up, Cyborg would maul her going to the ground. Cy- Cyborg's ground and pound is vicious. Yeah. If you talk about women's division, I think it's the most vicious, uh, you know, ground and pound that any woman has, either at 135 or 145. And Cyborg is going to take Jermaine down, no problem. Yeah. So, stylistically, that is going to be a horrible matchup, I think, for Jermaine. Uh, but you know, talking about this fight, I think it was robbery. I I thought Holly at least deserved a draw. She yeah. did not deserve to lose. Yeah, I, I agree. I was uh, quite disappointed as well, having seen Holly lost, lose the last two times as well. Fair and square, <laughs> you know. But this time, uh, I think, uh, you know, they got the wrong, uh, not only the wrong decision, but the referee got it 
very wrong uh, as well. And that's always very sad to see because these fighters put in so, so much. And just because the referee gets it wrong, it should not, you know, it's wrong to affect the, the fighters. And I think, of course, you know, uh, in my interview recently with uh, uh, the All India Mixed Martial Arts official, Daniel Isaac, uh, you know, we did uh, uh, speak about this and he did talk about, uh, of course, you know, maybe having like a DRS type system for certain things which might be decision making. But having right. put that apart, you know, he, he did also speak about uh, uh, that, you know, if the referee didn't see it, it didn't happen. That I don't agree with, of course. The referee is, uh, you know, human, of course, he's trained, but he's as human as anybody else. So let's not, you know, put so much, you know, belief that whatever he's doing, you cannot question it. But having said that, these problems, like we've said, happen, do happen with the referees, wrong judgments everywhere. But that doesn't make it all right. That's my point. That doesn't yeah. make it all right. Guess- when a referee gets it wrong, and Dana White is saying he got it wrong. He's questioning it. He's saying they got it wrong and they need to get it right. We need to do the same here. Let's not make the referees sacred cows, you know, who can do no wrong. You know, they are humans. They do get it wrong. Everyone has to question why and they have to improve their game because we cannot have decisions or fighters losing fights because of wrong decisions. They're humans, we understand it, but we need to improve that, always look at it. And they did say they review it. It's not just their job to review it. It's quite a few people's job to review it. It's the promoter's job to bring it out. It's the media, MMA media's job to pinpoint it as well. So, so referee decisions all over need to improve and there de- does need to be scrutiny as to when rules are not being followed. Like we just mentioned, the second time around, it should have automatically have been a point deduction. Right. And you know, if someone says you cannot question a referee, they're being ignorant. Because, you know, once and, and take it whichever way, you know, people can take it whichever way they want. Because once they're inside the cage, the fighters' lives depend on the referee's decisions. Yeah. Essentially putting your complete faith in the referee. So if you say, oh, a referee cannot be challenged or his decision cannot be challenged, that is just being ignorant. Of course you have to. Yeah. You know, uh, the thing is... Why do people train? Why do you know the referees train uh, or get trained for years before they officiate a fight? Because they need to they need to know which position they have to be in at certain points at, at all times. And just saying, oh, you know, just because we have as a commission, as a self-sanctioned commission, appointed a referee, you cannot question them. That cannot happen. That cannot happen in India. That cannot happen anywhere in the world. So if a referee has done something wrong or if there is a questionable or an objectionable uh, situation, you have to point it out. Now, you know, you can go on social media and just say whatever you want. That's that's your opinion. It's subjective. What is not subjective, however, is that it is the referee's job to get things right. If he, if he does not, it's our responsibility or the responsibility of the MMA media to say that it's not right. You know, so... Th- Again, you know, we come down to certain errors in the UFC. What has happened with Steve Masagati, who has officiated in high-level UFC fights, but did not do the rest of them. Dana White said he will never, ever officiate again in the UFC at at some point. So, when the biggest promoter in the world is so hard, you know, comes down so hard on the referees, just because you are, A, the commissioner of the association, that is approving the offici- uh, approving the the referees doesn't mean that you have to trust anything and everything the referee does. You have to question the referees. That has to be that has to be the job of you know both the commission and the MMA media. So I don't think that there is there are two ways about that. Uh, I, I think even Dana White, you know, even while taking to Megan uh, Megan O'Leary after UFC 208, said, oh, you know. Uh, he was pissed off with how the officiating went. He said, "This, this refereeing is not, is not right." Yeah. He said, "It will never happen again." So that is the hard stance that promoters or anyone associated with the sport need to take. Yeah. You know, if something is wrong, you have to say that it's wrong. Yeah. Great. So that was our coverage of UFC 208. We're going to come back to you after this short break. Hello? Check? Are you there? Hello? Are you there? Yes, I'm here. 
All right, how are you doing, sir? Are you there? I'm doing good. All right, thank you for taking the time out to talk to us. We appreciate it. No, you're welcome. All right, so, so firstly, uh, I wanted to dwell a little on your kickboxing pedigree. Now you were introduced to martial arts at a very young age. So can you tell us how it has helped shape your path into becoming a fighter? So the thing is, I didn't start by a Muay but I started by a MMA. And from MMA, I, uh, I keep going to Muay And from Muay I did, I went back to MMA. So just to correct that. Right. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, you know, you, as, as, as you said, you were also uh, involved in various aspects of martial arts and even wrestling. So, you know, can, can you talk about, yeah. talk about a little about how wrestling has, has laid a strong foundation uh, into you becoming the fighter that you are today? Honestly, I, I never expect to be where I am today. Right. But, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's very grateful. He's grateful. He's grateful, and, he's, uh, and for some, for something, you know, it's a, it's a blessing, you know. So, yeah. But he's more, more that he's, 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 he's grateful. He's grateful to, to, to arrive and achieve what I did. Because I never expect, you know, to stop. And, uh, yeah, he's, he's very, on, on my own, he's very good All right, great. Right. Now, you know, you're, you're currently on a three-fight win streak and uh, will be facing a tough opposition in Ollie Thompson. So what is your take on your opponent and how do you see the fight play out? You know, we used to, uh, we used to be a uh, teammate, we make uh, during certain times. And uh, for this, you know, I have, I have no idea if you uh, know me very well. So... Mm -hmm. uh, Stuff. He's, a, he's, a, he's a big guy, strong guy, you know, he's a really good brother. So, uh, what, what, should, what I should expect, I, I don't know, and uh, why I'm supposed to think about that, I have no idea. He is, I'm gonna make, uh, so I'm gonna face uh, somebody who used to be uh, in my uh, entourage. So, I just need to be prepared and uh, and what's scary as that. That's it. Right. Now, uh, also, Sheik, you faced Vitaly nearly three years ago for the heavyweight strap. And now that Scott Coker yeah. recently talked about crowning a new champion in the first quarter of 2017, do you think a victory over Oli would give you the opportunity to fight for the title? For me, necessarily, the thing is, I'm not thinking about that at all because uh, I used to stop thinking about the different ways to, uh, to fight for the title. The thing is, I think the focus on, on the shot I got, and that's it. So, uh, it should be great for me, you know, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but that, honestly, I have no perspective. No perspective, no, I just, I just try, I can't, I just try to, uh, to stay, uh, stay deep on the base I got in, uh, and be, uh, to be sure, you know, the world is done. Alright, great. Now, uh, one of the men that you defeated earlier in your career, Matt Mitrion, will be welcoming Fedor to the Bellator, to Bellator MMA and Bellator 172. So, what are your thoughts on yeah. Fedor fighting on the same card as you? Honestly, it should be, it should be a really good fight. And, 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 uh, and honestly, even for, for both of us. Right. So, so we, you know, uh, Fidel used to get all the crowd and all the, 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 the voice for him, but you know, uh, Matt is, is pretty big guy too. So, uh, and, uh, it's coming really for you to be, be done with it. You could change, everything could change. Can I get the board? No, I'm just Yes, so, uh, about that, you know, we should be super easy to say, uh, Fidel, but, you know, uh, uh, this year, I'm great to see. So, we have some, we have some, some, some stuff to show, you know, to show and, and, uh, and, and to put on the table as a statement, you know, and I think that's what we're gonna do. So, uh, for him, you know, that's, uh, that's a leader, that's a comeback. So, we right. don't wanna know that, that, that's an opportunity. Right. Now, you know, talking about Fedor fighting in Bellator MMA, there has been an influx of notable fighters, uh, in Bellator MMA. 
So, what are your thoughts on getting more competition in different divisions? Well, I think that's great because you get to be to put more rewards, you know, more uh, great rewards. Right. And, and, uh, and, 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 and also just to be the best. Right. Yeah. Yes. And now, and you know. Gonna be, you're going to be. Yeah, please right. Now, you know, you had earlier talked about making a statement with your victory. Now, would that be something that you'd look to do against Oli as well in your, in your next fight? Well, uh, yes. But uh, as I said, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not thinking about what happened. My, my concern would be to, to, to step in the fight. And no matter what we get to win. So, uh, and uh, make for sure and uh, really do the fighting fight, but I'm not thinking about about the opportunity to, uh, to to win and just prove to people, okay, uh, you know, uh, now I just want to speak to myself. And the way to speak to myself is just to be selfish. I'm, I come, I show up, and I win. That's it. Right, fair enough. Now, you know, finally, I have, uh, you know, one, one last question for you. Do you have any message for the Indian fans uh, that will tune in to see you fight next weekend? Mm. I wish they, they will enjoy the sport, you know. Yeah. Because they, 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 they talk no matter what, but they take all the pleasure with that course. You know, I think, you know, sport brings a lot of things on the table. And uh, for some reason, people need to forget this. So if you didn't, if you never did sport, so uh, I think life should be different. Right. And, and, uh, and any type of competition, any type of competition, you know, no matter what the way it is, is a kind of sport. So. Right. And and have you ever been yes, down yes. to India before? Uh, yes, I've been to a uh, position. Okay. All right. So well, what do you think about India and what do you think about coming back to India sometime soon? No, I mean, see, that, 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 that's really great in there. It's really great, you know, and uh, for sure the last time is well different than what we have here in, uh, in, so in America and Europe. But uh, that's the great, it's a good uh, lifestyle. For sure. And also, the, and the sport is to increase and evolve, no matter what. So that does the thing, you know, uh, which could cause me a lot. Yeah. Right. Yes, I dare you have some, uh, you have the kind of, uh, I, I don't know if you have the, the special, uh, wrestling, you know. I don't know who's from where, but the guys used to move to wrestle with, uh, with uh, the people on the, on the body, and they wrestle with, uh, with the white fans. So it's silly. It's silly and Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you once again, uh, Sheikh, for taking the time out to talk to us. It's been a pleasure. We appreciate it. No, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good day, sir. You too. Bye. Hi. Hello, Patrick. How are you doing today, sir? Hi, Patrick. How are you doing today? You will say the next part of the day, I'm good, thank you. And you, how are you? I'm doing very well, and uh, thank you for taking the time out to talk to us. We appreciate it. Mm. You're welcome. All right. Uh, so, firstly, uh, you've been out of the cage for the major part of a year since your last fight. So, can you tell us how your training camp has been coming along for your upcoming fight? Yeah, but, uh, how long has it been on the cage? So, I was going to go to the first time. I was going to go to the first time. I was going to go to the first time. I was going to go to the first time. I was going to go to the first time. I was going to go to the first time. I was going to go to the first time. I was going to yeah, unfortunately, uh, I, I wanted to be a bit more active, 
but I had some health issues that prevented me from fighting in December, like I was supposed to. But uh, I've been ready, I've been training, uh, and keeping myself uh, in the best conditions possible, so I'm ready for the job. Right. Uh, as you said, you know, you're supposed to fight campers in December, but were out injured. So, are you at 100% going into the fight? Uh, you know, are there any injury niggles that, that you have at the moment? Uh, because, uh, I don't know. going to this fight uh, with enrich my career getting uh, getting to this one such a big fight if I wasn't in the best of my conditions I would probably take the fight without being 100% against someone else but against Josh I just couldn't afford it so you can be sure when I step into the cage I'll be the best it can possibly be right now talking about uh, the upcoming fight with Josh yeah, you'll be facing another contender in 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 Thompson, and uh, Thompson has looked impressive since his Peloton MMA debut, and has defeated several notable fighters in the past as well. So, how do you assess Thompson's ground game, and how do you see the fight uh, play out? <laughs> E como você vê essa luta se desenvolvendo? Achando que fica aqui. Ele é um cara. Ele é um cara que tem um jiu-jitsu muito bom. É um cara, como a gente fala no jiu-jitsu, é um cara escorregador. Ele é um cara que não desiste das posições, então ele encaixa nele, que troca as posições, que faz um dirimbolo, um stand muito bom. E eu acho que ele vai querer me agarrar. Na primeira oportunidade que ele tiver, ele vai querer tentar me derrubar e, e pôr esse jogo de jiu-jitsu. Mas eu vou estar preparado tanto para bloquear e acabar com a, com a raça dele. Então, ele é muito bom, seu jogo de jiu-jitsu é excelente. Ele é como nós usamos o jogo de jiu-jitsu, é slick. Ele é sempre procurando por novas posições e por submissões. Ele é muito bom em scrambles. He he never stops. He's always uh, he has a very active ground game. But I'll be ready for him. And I'm presuming he gets black belt and a real black belt, and I will be able to. I believe I will be able to stop even stop him from getting to the ground. But if it gets there, I think I'll be able to match well with him and get the best of him. Right now, adding to that, Josh's last fight came over a year ago. So, do you think that might play a factor in your fight? Josh, look at the last one. There is no one atrás. Você acha que isso vai afetar mais um ano? Você acha que isso vai afetar de alguma maneira nessa luta? Não. Eu acho que ele vai estar, ele vai estar preparado para outra vez. Ele nunca se mostrou despreparado e principalmente na casa dele. Ele sempre está tá mostrando grandes lutas e grandes apontes, grande, é, grande carne, bem preparado, sempre está bem. Principalmente ele não vai fazer isso na casa dele. É um bem fisicamente bem preparado. Ele não vai lutar sem isso e, e fora de forma. Eu tenho certeza disso. Não acho Uh, he's been through a long layoff in his career in the past and always came back to keep him the best of his skills. And this is a fight that's going to take place in his hometown. And he wouldn't allow himself to be there without being the best shape possible and supporting the best performance he could, he could prepare for him. So 
I am expecting him to be in the best uh, shape he can be and to, to bring the best of his game. All right. Uh, now, you and your brother have been involved in the title picture for some time now. So, can you also give us, you know, we talk about the training camps, we talk about the physical aspects, but can you give us an insight into how you help each other mentally going into big fights? Você pode falar como você e seu irmão se ajudam mentalmente em lutar com as lutas? É, é, essa aí pra mim, é, essa pergunta aí, assim que tem muitos palavrões e, e tem muita, muita agressividade. É, a, gente, a, gente, a gente aprendeu isso com o nosso professor, que, que é falecido, Bruno Gouveia. É, ele, sempre transforma, ele sempre transformava em casa em leões. Então, é uma motivação diária, é uma coisa que a gente estuda, olha, assiste, vê, principalmente uma coisa que não existe em muitos adversários, em muitos atletas, é, é o instinto de brigão, o instinto de leão, o instinto agressivo, o instinto matador. Então, quando um atleta não tem isso, a gente não vê tão, tão perigo e o quanto esse cara é difícil de ser batido. Quando o cara não oferece isso, é, a gente vê de uma oportunidade melhor de você e treinar umas técnicas e, e fazer o teste. Você tem que ser isso. 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 Nós aprendemos isso com o nosso coach Bruno Gouveia, que foi passado há alguns anos atrás. E ele transformou a forma de chip em um lion. E ele sempre bring something extra and, and say something that will pump us up and, and give everyone extra motivation and make us uh, hungry and, and thirsty going to the fight. Uh, when we get in some big fight like this, if it's someone that you see with a strong will who comes to finish who's not just trying to, to outsmart you but also trying to outfight you, it gives us the extra push, but when we see someone who's just a big strategy, uh, we're already going there, having been doing that guy. So we, we prepare ourselves mentally uh, to give us a strong mind going into the fight, and unless this guy has a strong will as we do, or before we step into the case, we already know we won. Alright, uh, great. Now, do you think a win over Josh would once again put you in the discussion about getting a title shot in 2017? Do you think that Josh would win the title não, não vejo muitos adversários, não vejo muita gente é, pronta para me chutar. Talvez o Beto coloque. Talvez o Beto coloque alguém para me chutar o cinturão só para movimentar a, a categoria. Eu acho que sim, eu acredito que eu estou indo nesse país. They're going to, to book me again, to send me again. Or they'll give send me someone else, and probably I'll have to make one more fight because our fight was so soon. Right. Uh, before they book me again. But I believe that beating Josh still gives me the chance to fight for the better All right. Now, uh, you know, you'll be fighting on the same card as Fedor Emelianenko, and there has been a lot of hype that is already created around Bellator 172. So, what are your thoughts on Fedor fighting on the same card as you uh, going into next week? Quais os pensamentos sobre Fedor no mesmo card, né? Tá tudo todo no mesmo card que você não pode tomar. Estou muito feliz. 
é uma oportunidade inexplicável. É um cara aqui de Rico Feliz, vamos dividir o queijo nesta noite, né, da próxima semana, dia 18 de fevereiro. É um cara que sempre admirei é, e tem a admira, admiração de muita gente. Então, um amigo meu já teve a oportunidade de, de lutar, e para mim ele vai ser, que é o Fábio Maldonado, e eu vou ter a oportunidade de dividir o mesmo que ele. Então, fico feliz por isso estar acontecendo. Yeah. Hello, it's a legend. Uh, it's a big, a big, big honor for me to fight in the same car as him. A uh, friend of mine uh, has fought me and I believe he's beat him. Uh, Ali Maldonado just recently. Right. But I still believe he's the greatest ever and he's a lot of happiness for me to be in the same car. All right, fantastic. Now, uh, finally, do you have any message for the Indian fans that will tune in to see you fight at Bellator 172? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Sure. Uh, so finally, I have one last question. Do you have any message for the Indian fans that will tune in to see you fight at Bellator 172? Uh, Mande uma mensagem para os fãs da Índia que vão assistir sua luta no Bellator 172. Uh, eu não sabia se. Que... Uh, que o pessoal na Índia assistia minha, 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 o evento. Mas fico feliz, é, espero que todos gostem da minha luta e conheçam o meu estilo. É o estilo que se busca de um acopiador, estilo agressivo, com muita raça, com muita vontade de acabar com o seu adversário. Mas tem na porrada. Eu não sabia que the fans in India who watch my fight. I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. And I hope I can so far, uh, make a very good fight for you guys. I'll be the, the aggressive fighter that, that you used to see. I'll try to win the fight at any opportunity that I have. And I hope you guys can have a blast. All right, outstanding. Thank you once again for taking the time out to talk to us, sir. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.